Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the Healthline Live Town Hall, Healthcare Policy Edition. We're broadcasting live from Healthline's offices in San Francisco. I'm Steve Swayze, Vice President of Communications for Healthline. Thank you for joining us today for a discussion about the important healthcare issues facing vo voters, that is voters, in the upcoming presidential election. And the word I stumbled on, voters, is really important. Above everything else that we discuss today, and no matter where you are in the political spectrum, we are encouraging you to vote. Voting is our right and our privilege. We have an impressive lineup of panelists for today's live town hall. But first, a quick introduction to Healthline. Healthline.com is the world's number one digital health information brand. Our mission is to build a stronger and healthier world. With our sister brands, Medical News Today and Greatest, Healthline publishes more than 1,000 articles and videos every month. Our content covers the entire spectrum of medical conditions. It's evidence-based, medically approved, and empathetically written. We work tirelessly to help you live your strongest and healthiest life. Today's Healthline Live Town Hall will be moderated by Healthline Editor-in-Chief Aaron Peterson. Aaron has been with Healthline, Healthline for more than eight years, rising to the role of Editor-in-Chief in July 2019. Aaron, terrific to see you. Great to see you too, Steve, and welcome everyone. Glad to be here today. Just so you all know, Steve and I are physically distancing, we're wearing our masks everywhere, and we're making sure to wash our hands frequently and thoroughly. Definitely recommend that everyone at home do the same. This virus and its impacts are very real, and we can't stress enough how important it is to take these safety precautions. The COVID pandemic has put healthcare front and center for many people as we face this upcoming election. According to a study uh, on Healthline, 65% of respondents said that this election and the outcome will have more of an impact on them personally than in previous years. We'll talk about all of this over the next 45 minutes. Our program today includes two panels. First, we'll hear from three industry leaders discussing healthcare policies. Then we'll meet two women who live with chronic conditions and are the human face of the discussion. We'll conclude with a special discussion on the disparity of maternal healthcare services for black mothers. We've received many questions from the media and our viewers, and we'll get to as many as possible over the course of the program. You may submit a question on whatever channel you're on and we'll track it. As we're broadcasting live, we'll jump in if there's breaking news. So let's get started. Aaron, over to you to welcome our first panelists. Thanks. First up, I'd like to welcome Dr. Susan Bailey, the president of the American Medical Association. For the last 173 years, the AMA has worked to promote the art and science of medicine for the betterment of public health. Welcome, Dr. Bailey. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. We also have Dr. Jamila Taylor, who is a Senior Director of Healthcare Reform and Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation, where she works to build upon the Affordable Care Act and work towards the next generation of health reform. Dr. Taylor, welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm pleased to be here for such an important discussion. Excellent. And joining soon, we'll also have Mr. John Rother, who is the President of the National Coalition on Healthcare Reform. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to cover. Um, so starting with the basics, I'd love to hear from each of you what your organizations are doing to help encourage people to vote and participate in this election. Dr. Bailey, let's start with you. Thank you. Um, there's no question that uh, medicine is affected dramatically uh, by what goes on in legislatures in across the country and in Washington, D.C. And um, physicians, sadly, um, are not great at getting out to vote because they put their uh, patients first. And if a medical emergency comes up when they were intending to go vote, they're going to take care of that patient. But this year, we're encouraging AMA employees, uh, as well as our membership, to draw on the materials and the toolkit of Vote Health 2020, which is a nonpartisan group that's encouraging physicians and other healthcare professionals to make sure they're registered to vote, first of all, uh, and then to actually make a plan to vote in the 2020 elections. That's awesome. Dr. Taylor, what about you? Well, the Century Foundation is a 100-year-old progressive think tank. So our focus is on ensuring that the American people have up-to-date information through our research, publications, and public events 
so that they can be informed about the issues they care about in this important election and beyond. Healthcare is one of our focus areas, and we also work on education equity and economic justice. That's great to hear, and thank you both so much for all that you're doing to get out the vote. And speaking of the election, Healthline recently published a side-by-side -side comparison of where each candidate candidate stands on 11 key issues in healthcare. And I'd like to specifically narrow in on uh, the campaign's responses or proposed responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Taylor, you're quoted in that article, so I'd love to start with you and get your assessment on where each campaign stands. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that there is a clear distinction between Vice President Biden and President Trump when it comes to their approaches on healthcare. The main one being that Mr. Biden is focused on expanding health care for the American people and building on the ACA, while President Trump is focused on taking it away. I think Elizabeth Wallace, the author on the piece, did a good job of laying out their positions in an objective way and concisely. I'll further that point by saying that um, the response to COVID-19 in this moment is deadlocked. Um, I will say that it was very disappointing that we heard just a few days ago that negotiations have been abandoned um, in terms of the next coronavirus response package at a time when millions of Americans, the majority of whom are low-income people and people of color, are hurting as a result of this virus. I think that's a really important point. Dr. Bailey, I'd love to hear your take. The uh, the AMA is a, a nonpartisan organization. Uh, it strives to work with both parties, and it has um, been in support of the Affordable Care Act for many years um, and um, encourage working on improving the Affordable Care Act as uh, opposed to uh, ditching it uh, for either a uh, single payer plan or um, or, you know, or even another plan that hasn't even been elucidated yet. Um, we believe it is crucial that um, all Americans have um, affordable, meaningful coverage that um, is um, refundable, that's advanceable and inversely and has tax credits inversely proportioned uh, to income. Thank you both. Our next question is about the cost of care. And this one comes from a freelance writer named Annette Boyle. Uh, she writes for Fierce Healthcare, US Medicine and BioWorld. And she asks, President Trump said he had pushed the cost of insulin down so much it was like water. But we know that insulin costs are bankrupting families and forcing diabetics to ration their meds and risk their health. While the big three now offer low cost generics and copay reduction programs, many patients and physicians remain unaware of them. What's really happening? So Drs. Bailey or, or Taylor, I'd love to hear your thoughts in response to uh, Mrs. Boyle's question. Uh, I'll start. Um, there's no question that the cost of um, healthcare in general, but specifically the cost of drugs um, is completely out of control. Um, and yes, of course, it's a very complicated system, um, but we are concerned about the overall lack of transparency in, um, in drug pricing. There have been so many middlemen that have come into the picture uh, between patients and uh, the pharmaceutical drug manufacturers um, that there are rebates and other costs in there um, that ultimately are helping make drugs more expensive. And a generic is not a generic anymore necessarily. There's different types of generics. So um, it is incredibly important that we minimize the disruption between physicians and patients when it comes to healthcare in general, but specifically with the cost of prescription drugs. Prescriptions must be able to prescribe for their patients the drugs that they think are best for them and not be encumbered by ridiculous prior authorization requirements and um, other obstacles to patient care. Dr. Taylor, anything to add? I mean, I'll just add that, um, you know, healthcare costs continue to be something that the American people care about. It's a top priority when they think about healthcare and where we need to move in terms of having more equitable costs, uh, more equitable care for, for everyone. Um, and so I think that in terms of prescription drugs, 
there needs to be, you know, clear transparency on the direction of, of where we're going in terms of having more generics accessible to more Americans. And again, you know, coming off of the point that we made earlier about the COVID-19 crisis, um, we're in a situation where the pandemic recession is impacting millions of American families, not only their health, but also their pocketbooks. And so affordability will be a key component of the direction we need to go in, in terms of healthcare coverage in this country. That's a great point. Um, we have another submitted question here, also from a freelance writer named Walter Yates. And he says, how does the lack of universal health care impact racial disparity in health care? Dr. Taylor, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Absolutely. Um, well, as a country, we have certainly made great strides since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, with more Americans covered probably than ever before. However, there are still gaps for many people, and those gaps tend to fall hardest on African Americans, Hispanics, and other people of color. A big reason for this is the lack of Medicaid expansion in Southern states, a region where about half of African Americans live. And even for those people that do have insurance, affordability remains a top concern, whether it's out-of-packet costs associated with prescription drugs, as we just talked about, and co-pays for health services, or even insurance premiums. Economic disadvantage falls hardest on people of color, so high health care costs can be a barrier to care. We need universal health care that is affordable and accessible to all, regardless of how much money a person has in their pocket or their employment status. Gaps in coverage and lack of insurance are also key reasons why people of color bear the brunt of chronic health conditions and premature death. But I'll also say this, we need to deal with racism and discrimination in the healthcare system. Coverage alone will not fix racial health disparities. All healthcare providers, professionals, and personnel must undergo anti-racism training, and it must be routine and ongoing. That's a really great point and actually segues really well into the next question, which is that while many organizations, including the AMA, um, have taken pledges to address and fight uh, systemic disparities within healthcare, racial disparities, what do those efforts look like if our political leaders are reticent to acknowledge that systemic racism exists? How do we move forward? <clears throat> It is, it's incredibly challenging to operate um, in a, a system where there's not equal cooperation to, um, to fight um, systemic um, injustice in our healthcare system as well as in our society. Um, but there are many levels of leadership and we need um, leaders of medical organizations, leaders of healthcare systems, uh, leaders of healthcare teams to um, look at their own systems and see um, how they are knowingly or unknowingly perpetuating um, disparities and um, not allowing for equal care to be given to all and for equal treatment for all of their employees. Um, we, the responsibility starts at home. Um, it begins with each of us to uh, be, to acknowledge um, our, um, the role that we may be playing ourselves uh, in racial inequities uh, and work within our systems to, um, to fight those inequities. Dr. Taylor, anything to add? Um, just the fact that, you know, this is a complex issue. Um, and what we do know, you know, within American society is that racism is embedded within every institution and structure in this country. And the healthcare system is no different. Um, and so that means that any plans or strategies to address um, or reckon with racial justice as a whole has to include addressing this issue um, in the context of the healthcare system as well. Excellent. And so as we wrap up, I'm curious to get your thoughts on um, if either of you have any specific advice for voters for whom healthcare is a key issue as they're heading into this election, what are your final thoughts and, and what would you tell them? Dr. Bailey? Um, we encourage our patients and I encourage everyone uh, to be informed, uh, to pay attention to what's going on, uh, to 
the the Healthline article uh, that you referenced that has the uh, positions of, of the two um, presidential candidates, I think is incredibly helpful in helping people you know, organize their thoughts. Uh, but the most important is have a plan to vote this year. Uh, it's going to look different than it has in years past. You may not be voting where you voted before. Uh, and even if you are, it may look and function quite differently. So give yourself plenty of time, give yourself a plan, um, and make sure and get out there and vote. Great. Dr. Taylor? I mean, I agree with everything Dr. Bailey said. It's so important to have a plan um, to execute um, for voting this year. But I'll also say this, vote like your life depends on it because it does. Healthcare is certainly on the ballot. We're in the midst of a, of a global pandemic um, where we still have you know, a lack of, of an adequate response to. And so it's time for folks to think about that when they go into the ballot, as well as the other issues that we've discussed today, whether it's you know, racial disparities in healthcare, um, economic justice issues, all of these issues are, are connected and, and healthcare is front and center. Thank you both. Those are both great takeaways. And I really appreciate you joining us today, sharing your insights, sharing your time. And thank you both for the work that you're doing to create a more equitable healthcare system and also to get people out to vote. Have a great day. Aaron, thank you for that. And Dr. Bailey, doc, Dr. Bailey and Dr. Taylor, thank you. Uh, we heard from John Rother. Uh, he apologized with technical difficulties. We are live. He was not able to join in, um, but he does uh, uh, send his comments. You can check them on our site uh, later. Um, hearing from these policy leaders, Aaron, uh, the concrete steps they're taking to improve the healthcare system for the people who need it most, uh, those are the 133 million people who live with a chronic condition. Um, Aaron's now going to introduce us to some guests who each put a human face to the chronic condition of healthcare. Thanks, Steve. Whether it's diabetes, anxiety and depression, asthma, or many other common health conditions, it's likely that you know someone who faces daily challenges that others take for granted. Like Steve just mentioned, nearly 133 people, 3 million people, excuse me, in the US are living with one or more chronic conditions which translates to roughly 40% of the population. And yet these stories often go unheard. So today I'm excited to bring in two women who in sharing their stories have become fierce advocates for the chronic illness community. Mila Clark Buckley was first diagnosed with type two diabetes in 2006, which prompted her to start the blog, The Hangry Woman, as a way to combat stigma against the condition as well as build community. More than a decade later, she learned that she had actually been misdiagnosed and was instead living with a slow progressing form of diabetes called latent autoimmune diabetes in adults or type 1.5 diabetes. Mariah Leach's journey with rheumatoid arthritis began in 2008 when she was just 25 years old. She learned firsthand the challenges that women face when trying to become parents and living with a chronic condition. Today, through her platform, Mama's Facing Forward, she works with other mothers living with chronic illnesses to support them. Mariah and Mila, thank you both so much for being here today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yes. So before we dive into the topic of healthcare, I'd love to learn a little bit more about each of you and sort of what motivated you to begin these platforms and how has that evolved into that type of advocacy work you do today? So Mila, let's start with you. What was the catalyst for The Hangry Woman? For me, I really started my blog because I couldn't find other people my age living with type 2 diabetes. And I also saw that there was a ton of stigma and shame around living with it. And I wanted to show people that you could live a happy, healthy life with diabetes and you didn't have to be ashamed of it. And there were people out there just like you who knew exactly what you were going through. Great, thanks Mila. And Mariah, what about you? How has your journey changed over the last 12 years? Well, the biggest change since my diagnosis is that today I have three kids. My boys are eight and six and they're downstairs hopefully doing their distance learning. And my daughter is two and thankfully she's with my mom right now. 
But when I was considering my first pregnancy, I desperately wanted to talk to another mom with RA just to hear from a real person that motherhood with a chronic illness was even possible. But at the time, the only resource I was able to find was a book I had to order all the way from Australia. And when I was postpartum with my first baby, I had friends who had become new moms at the same time as me, but they really didn't understand the unique challenges I was facing, like having to choose between treating my RA and breastfeeding. So I started Mamas Facing Forward with the hope that other women wouldn't have to feel as alone as I did, and so that they could find the resources they needed and feel supported by a community that understands what it's like to be a mom with chronic illness. Thank you both for sharing and for starting those communities. Now, shifting gears and talking about healthcare, we know that the cost of care is much higher in the US than in other Western countries. What's it been like for both of you to navigate those costs, both for routine care and also to cover prescriptions? Mila, let's start with you. For diabetes itself, it's one of the most expensive chronic illnesses to live with. And there are a lot of costs that people don't think about. So of course, insulin, which is skyrocketing in price year over year. There's also the cost of diabetes tech supplies, like constant glucose monitors, test strips, meters, your doctor's appointments. And then as well, since diabetes affects the whole body, you have tons of specialist appointments, eye doctors going to the dentist regularly, you might have a foot specialist, you might have an endocrinologist. And so I think that living with diabetes is really one of those areas where patients have to make sacrifices to be able to afford their care. We have to make sacrifices to make sure we get the well-rounded care we need. And sometimes that's disappointing and it causes hurdles for us that we don't anticipate or we don't see when we first get that diagnosis. Right. And Mariah, what about you? Is that similar to your experience? Uh, yeah. So I rely on a biologic medication to keep my RA in control so that I can function in my daily life. And these medications are extremely expensive, as in thousands of dollars of mo a month. I once received a bill for more than $6,000 after a single infusion, and that was after my insurance paid its portion. Uh, thankfully, copay assistance programs exist because otherwise it would be impossible for me to access these medications, which are really life changing medications. But even with the assistance of those copay programs, my healthcare costs end up eating an enormous portion of our family's budget. And that's really challenging, not only from a financial, financial perspective, but also because when I think about the opportunities and resources we could provide our children if my healthcare costs weren't quite so high. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And something that both of you just spoke to is that there's these trade-offs that have to be made and there's these hidden costs that a lot of people don't think about. And to that point, a, a big topic that tends to come up is that you see people who are traveling out of the country in order to afford their medications. I'm curious if that's a theme that comes up in your communities. Yeah, specifically in the diabetes community, that comes up a lot. Sometimes it's cheaper to fly to Canada or Mexico and, and get your insulin than it is to buy insulin in your own country. And that's a huge barrier for patients living with diabetes. I think something else that also comes up a lot of the time is that people with diabetes make really hard decisions like rationing their insulin because they can't afford it or they can't afford to go to another country to get it. And so you really really kind of destroy your body and you you make sacrifices about your general health just to be able to afford a prescription that should be affordable to you. Um, and it is really hurtful to the community because we see these really tough instances of people foregoing food or rent or like I mentioned, rationing their medications until they can get their next prescription. Um, and those things are really detrimental to the overall health of patients with diabetes. Mariah, is this something that comes up in the RA community as well? So I haven't in my community heard too much about people crossing the border for treatments, uh, but there are women from all over the world in my support group. And the women who live outside the US are often shocked when we talk about the healthcare costs in our group. They're also appalled when U.S. residents talk about all the insurance hoops that they have to jump through so that they can get the medications and care that they need in the first place. So there's definitely a difference between what's going on here and what's happening in the rest of the world. Right, right. And I think both of you just spoke to the importance of having that coverage as a supplement. And so what are your biggest concerns about the potential of the Affordable Care Act being repealed? 
I think for me, it's really considering the protection that it gives patients. Patients with pre-existing conditions aren't discriminated against or denied coverage. I know that if the ACA was repealed or taken away and there was no replacement or no safety net, I probably wouldn't feel comfortable having a chronic illness. And, and that's not something that can go away. It's not something that I can just get rid of one day, but it would really make me feel insecure about how I might be able to afford medication or if insurance would cover me to be able to afford what I need to afford to be able to take care of my health in general. So I think that that conversation happening is, is something that really needs to take patients into account. And although it is very political, it's something that really needs to take into account the people that it's affecting. Because when patients don't have the coverage or the access that they need, they can't take care of themselves. And that's not good for anyone. Uh, Mariah, so I, anything to I, add? I have a lot of concerns about this issue, but I'll agree that the thing I worry about the most is what happens to people with pre existing conditions. Because there seems to be some sort of stigma attached to that phrase. Some people seem to think that the person with the condition just didn't make the right life choices to stay healthy. But, you know, people with the benefit of good health often don't realize how easily they could find themselves in that pre existing condition category. For example, when I was 25 years old, one day I was a busy law student. I played water polo. I went snowboarding. I was extremely active, perfectly healthy. And suddenly I was having trouble walking and it hurt to lift a mug of coffee. And I didn't do anything to make that happen to me. It just happened. And that's why having good health insurance is so important because you really never know what could happen in the future. That's an excellent point. And I think perfectly illustrates exactly what's at stake with this election. And so before we go, I'd love to get your thoughts on the election and most specifically, why is voting important to you? And how are you talking about this election with your communities? For me personally, voting is so important because I come from a family of immigrants. And so my family, though they live here and they have status here, they aren't citizens, they can't vote. And I was born here and I can. And so I feel a responsibility to make sure that my voice is heard and that I take the time to really ensure that I am a part of the process. Um, I think it's also important because we don't realize how much politics influences just about everything in our lives and especially when it comes to healthcare. And so I think, you know, we heard, especially last night in the president, the vice presidential debate and here today with um, some of the doctors who spoke, it, you know, you have to vote like your life depends on it. And for me, as someone with a chronic illness, I do feel like my life mm. depends on it. And it's something that I want to make sure that I'm a part of and that I'm encouraging my community to also get involved with. No matter where they stand, getting involved is, is important, but I think it's important to make sure your voice is heard and you are represented by the people who want to earn your vote and represent you. So for my community, I, I mean, I think voting allows you to use your voice and that is so important. Your story can actually impact the future of healthcare policy. I live in Colorado and I've gone down to the state capitol and given testimony to tell elected officials what it's really like to live with a chronic illness. And in sharing my story, I was able to help pass laws here in Colorado that protect patients' rights when it comes to biosimilars and step therapy. But you don't have to testify at a hearing or anything that big to make a difference. You can make a difference simply by voting and you need to vote at every level of the government. We need to have people in power who are willing to listen to our stories and take action to improve the way healthcare policies impact our families. Mila and Mariah, thank you both so much for being here today. You're both doing such incredible work and I wish we could talk for another hour, but I appreciate you both being here and sharing your perspectives. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Compelling discussions indeed um, with uh, hundreds of millions of people uh, looking at an election coming up, we have heard from some policy experts. We've heard from people with a, uh, a chronic condition, and they're all compelling stories. And our next guest has an equally urgent message. Alexis Dent is an author of a story that is coming up shortly on Healthline Parenthood. It's an expose about the disparities of maternal health for black women. 
Alexis's article will run on Healthline Parenthood in the next couple of days, so be on the lookout for it. Alexis, welcome to Healthline. Hi, thank you for having me. Alexis, the uh, American Bar Association has reported, and I'm quoting, black people simply are not receiving the same quality of health care that their white counterparts receive. In your reporting for the upcoming story in Healthline Parenthood, it's about 15,000 words, it's a long expose, uh, you've written that this is the most apparent in the case of black maternal health, where preventable deaths occur due to these racial biases. Would you please elaborate for us? Of course. Uh, 2020 has taught us anything. It's that there's still a lot of bias in this world. Um, but an important nuance to make, especially in the case of healthcare, is that this isn't always explicit bias. Oftentimes, it's implicit based on learned thoughts and behaviors that people in the healthcare industry, as well as the world at large, has. So as Dr. Taylor mentioned earlier in this uh, town hall, having anti-racist training for anyone across the complete healthcare industry is really important to fix these racial inequities and prevent these maternal deaths. And Alexis, to that point, I wanted to just read back a part of the article that really struck me where you say, the United States continues to be the richest country in the world, yet black women face startling maternal mortality rates that are three to four times higher than the maternal mortality rates of white women in America. Could you speak a little bit more on this, just expand on that, and, and how does that show up? Yeah. A really devastating example is Shalon Irving, who in 2017, at the age of 36, passed after giving birth to her child, Soleil. Um, it was a great example of having equal access to health care, but not equitable access. Uh, Shalon was an epidemiologist for the CDC, so she had the knowledge and the resources to get the health care that she needed. But when she went to the doctors uh, repeatedly after giving birth with uh, problems from rapid weight gain to a hematoma, she was constantly said, told, hey, those are typical postpartum issues, go home. And um, after one visit, shortly after, um, just a few hours after going to the doctor complaining about another postpartum issue, she collapsed and passed away at the hospital a few hours later. Um, another great example is Serena Williams even, who has all the resources and money in the world and is very vocal about her experiences and struggles being heard as she had to advocate for herself shortly after giving birth um, and say, hey, like, I think I have another blood clot and he wasn't heard. And so we really need to make sure that these implicit biases aren't preventing healthcare providers from giving care that is not only evidence-based, but also empathetic. Alexis, bluntly, what's at stake for black mothers in this upcoming election? What's at stake is not only equal access to health care, but equitable access to health care. So not only making sure that everyone can receive the health care that they need, but also that it's done in a way where you can feel validated, your health issues are heard. And quite frankly, evidence-based health care is at stake with this election. Um, we, we're really seeing that now, um, especially in the past week. So I would really, really urge anyone watching this to vote truly as has been echoed many times today. Your vote like your life depends on it because for a lot of people, especially black mothers, it very well may. Well, Alexis, thank you for your work on this, for your commitment to keeping us informed about issues that many of us don't pay attention to. We need to be focused on the inequities in uh, healthcare. Uh, we're going to do something that's a bit off script um, because we just heard um, as we've been broadcasting that the president has said he will not in participate in a, in a virtual debate as we're having a virtual discussion right now. So all of our panelists who are still here, if we can ask them to join and we want to rejoin if they've stayed on. Dr. Taylor, good to see you again. Thank you, Dr. Bailey, good to see you again. Um, we didn't prepare for this because we didn't know this, but this morning President Trump said he will not participate in a virtual debate. And I was just looking and I'm not finding it on my phone right now, but I saw the quote he gave um, that it was ridiculous, it, didn't, it wasn't effective, and instead he's going to do a rally. Uh, Vice President Biden, candidate Biden, has, has responded that he wants to speak to the American people directly. So it remains to be seen if the October 15th debate will go forward but the commission did decide to do it virtually because of the coronavirus and uh, affecting the president and many in his employee, as well as other people that they're exposed to. So without 
preparation, um, asking you if you have a response to the president denying uh, the second debate. I'll go ahead and start. Um, I respect the decision of the uh, debate commission to, to hold the debate virtually. Um, we have been um, talking about how important it is to wear masks, to social distance, to wash your hands, to avoid crowds, uh, especially indoors um, since the early days of this pandemic. And we think that every event in our country, regardless of whether it's as important as the presidential debate um, or as you know personal as a birthday party, to, to follow these basic guidelines. Um, we're doing this event uh, via um, uh, virtually. Um, and I think it's going very well. And I think we're communicating as well as we um, did, we could have if we were in person. Um, we're doing so many things virtually now, and it's just kind of become second nature to us. Um, so we're going to work this way. We're going to church this way. We're visiting with friends this way. Um, and um, I respect the debate commission and um, I hope the president will change his mind. Dr. Taylor? Yeah, yeah, I'll just chime in and, and say, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with everything Dr. Bailey said. Um, I'll also add that it's it's pretty inconceivable um, to proceed with um, an in-person event um, debate, especially because so many people, um, you know, in the last, you know, recent days have contracted COVID-19. Um, we've seen this front and center with um, an event that was held at the White House not too long ago. Um, so, so I'm just baffled at the fact that, um, you know, President Trump um, has decided not to participate. And as Dr. Bailey said, I hope he changes his mind. At the end of the day, that's in the best interest of everyone involved, whether it's folks in front of the camera, as well as those behind the camera, um, the essential workers that may have to cover these events. Um, so it's really for the safety of everyone involved. So, so I think that in this moment, it just does not make sense to hold another in-person event um, and put people's lives at risk. Thank you for those comments spontaneously. Um, and Dr. Bailey, you did mention that uh, we're doing just so much virtually places of worship and birthday parties. Um, not to do a plug for anybody because we're not involved, but I saw that the world's largest tech conference um, and again, this is not a commercial endorsement, but it's, uh, I think, newsworthy. It's 100,000 people gather every year, um, and they have just announced they're going to move ahead with it. There has not been the software that supports 100,000 people connecting, and they've developed that software. Um, and uh, it's germane to this discussion. So virtually everything is available virtually. And um, we agree, it's good to debate, and we appreciate you being here and returning for this spontaneous question. Aaron, while we have doctors, Taylor and Bailey, uh, any other spontaneous questions at the very end here? I think they said it all. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you again, Dr. Bailey. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Well, it has been a fascinating discussion. Um, you know, and I watched all of our panelists, uh, including this last spontaneous bit, Aaron, um, speaking from the heart and speaking of the severity of the concern of what's at stake in this upcoming election. Yeah, Steve, I'm I'm so grateful for everyone who was able to join this discussion today. And I think the pandemic has really thrown a lot of big issues into a stark relief. And all of the different perspectives we heard today really just, for me, drive home that it's so much bigger than any one of us. And that when we're going to vote this year, we're not just voting for ourselves, but we're voting for our communities. So I'm feeling really energized as we as we wrap up. Voting. It's our privilege, it's our right. One thing we have not mentioned in this broadcast and we do wanna mention is get your flu shot. Um, we don't want a twindemic, so get your flu shot now. Anytime in October is a good time to do it. Um, and vote, go to the polls. And so that concludes this Healthline Live Town Hall, the healthcare policy edition. If you'd like more information from our session today, including uh, Mr. Rother's comments, as he apologized was technically not able to join, um, you can log on to healthline.com, which is www.healthline.com, or follow any of our social media pages. And again, the opportunity to vote is ours. It's a privilege, it's a right, and we should do it. Please exercise your right to vote. 
Stay physically distanced, wear your masks. We've got ours and wash your hands frequently and get your flu shot. With Healthline Editor-in-Chief Aaron Peterson, I'm Steve Swayze from Healthline, thanking you for joining us today. Stay tuned as we will have live town halls quarterly at least, if not more frequently. We appreciate you joining us and we wish you a good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening. Stay safe and healthy out there, everyone, and we'll see you at the polls.